a more Coulomb uh, flow or failure criterion. You know, we were studying this new uh, dimension, if you will, for flow surfaces or yield surfaces to depend on what's going to become the uh, hydraulic axis or the hydrostatic axis rather than. Um, so we, we stopped at a, uh, at a sketch right, where we were looking at the differences right, between the, the three models. And I just want to overemphasize that because I think that that's so important uh, that you know, perhaps it's worth doing it again. So um, let's see. So here's what could be my J2 circle in the sigma 1, sigma 2, sigma 3 inventory plane, right? My hydrostatic axis are coming out. Um, each one of these points here is an intersect with a tension corner, right? And the other ones are intersections with the compression state of stress, right? And then we saw that Tresca had the following shape, right? It's a hexagon, okay? And again, the, the dimensions here are not the greatest. You have to do it to scale on paper to really be able to to see the dimensions, okay, but that's a hexagon, okay. So this is J2, this is Tresca. And so far, the point is that the compressive corners and the tensile corners have exactly the same length for both J2 and, and Tresca, okay. The only difference between J2 and Tresca is this straight versus circular feature, right? But then, um, more Coulomb takes it one step further and allows you to reduce the strength in a tensile corner versus a compressive corner. So, for instance, more Coulomb, and I'm going to exaggerate here, enables you to do this. Okay, so that reduction takes place everywhere with the same amount. So then this becomes that, becomes this, okay, and then you land back here. Okay, so to make it easier for the eye, I've labeled these guys with a little, say, square, those intersection points. So we've been calling those guys tension or tensile corners, and this guy has been a compression. So the distance, say, from here to there, call it A. And the distance, say, from here to the same point, call it B. They're different, right? So in this case, in more Coulomb, you are allowed for A's that are less than or greater than B. Right? That's the point. And we stop there, right? So, okay, and then we saw the effect of phi, right? We saw that when phi approaches 90, you approach a triangle. When phi approaches zero, you go back to approaching the, the tensile, I mean, the Tresca shape in the Marcus. Okay, so 
fairly simple generalization, if you will, of the Tresca model. But then we take it one step further and say, okay, that's great, that's yielding, but then there are other things about, say, pressure-dependent materials that are not present in other materials. So, so far we have mentioned how they yield, and we have written this yield surface that is the one that gives us these six planes that we just drew there, okay, for values of A and B that are one, two, or three, and A is not equal to B. It's the whole point. You have to take the difference between two different stress principal stresses, right? And then we let G uh, be a plastic potential function. Such that G equals sigma A minus sigma B absolute value, just like F, minus some constant that we're going to call G naught, plus sigma A plus sigma B times the sine function of a new angle that we're going to call psi. Okay, so notice that psi is not phi or phi, okay? And notice that this term here is essentially a constant, it's not a function of a stress state, it's whatever phi is times 2c, right? The cosine of phi times 2c, is, it's a constant. Right? That is pretty much encapsulated in this parameter but again, they don't have to be the same thing, okay? So in a way, you have two new degrees of freedom here. Right? You have your choice of phi, or, 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 or psi, I'm sorry, uh, to be different than phi. And G naught essentially gives you another parameter that if you will, you can see it as the effect of C, this cohesion that we have in the Markovian. Okay, one affects the tilt, remember? So if you see it in the sigma tau plane for now, we haven't talked about the stress plane yet, but essentially if you see it in the sigma tau plane, this is P, this is C. Okay, so this is your F equals zero. There is going to be a new function here, another function. And I'm going to exaggerate it. Ah, no, too much. I overdid it. Um, yeah. Perhaps like that. Okay? With a different C angle, right? And a different intercept. This intercept here is G. That's the point. Or, no, that's not G naught. I'm lying. Is it so when this is equal to zero? Yeah, that's not exactly G naught. G naught will control this, but it's not exactly this distance. So let's just say that this is a function of G0, because right now I'm not seeing the geometrical interpretation of G0 straight on that plane. Okay. But I do know that G0 will control that height, but I don't think it's exactly that height. Okay. All right, so, um, so let's define side, because that's really the 
the hero of the day. Gene Hart is just a, a free parameter. Um, so this is the dilatancy angle. Um, of course, if psi equals to phi, as we're going to see, then you have associative plasticity. <coughs> Yes, you're back to the classic associative theory. But we'll see that they won't be the same in general. So what is psi? Okay, so here is, and we will get more formal about psi in a minute, but if you apply a shear stress, a state of shear stress tau, okay, so say this is your state of stress. Okay, in a pressure dependent, so maybe even granular material. What, unlike, say, rubbers or metals, where you, you, know, you apply a shear stress and all you get is a shear strain, in a pressure dependent material, say concrete, granular materials, etc., you apply a tau and you would get a shear strain as usual but you will also get a shear, a, a volumetric strain. So the material, so in a typical solid that you might be used to seeing, this is the response. Okay, we call that an isochoic deformation or a constant volume deformation. Right? Because all you did was shear. In a pressure dependent or granular material, your deformation will have that isochoric component plus a volumetric component. Okay. And this angle here as we will see inside. Okay. It controls that effect, this tendency for the material to not only have a deformation component in the shear plane, but also in the volumetric. So, but we'll, again, we'll, we'll define it more, more formally. So, there is a volumetric Uh, expansion <coughs> with shear. Okay, this is typical in pressure dependent. And I always, when I teach this in uh, regular general audiences, I give the knuckle uh, example. So if you take your knuckles, your two hands, and you put them together like this, and you try to shear your knuckles one past the other, so you try to do this, right? Your knuckles, because of their morphology, right, before, be, because of their shape and the uh, and their configuration, in order to shear them, they have to first sort of separate before you can really shear. Right? So you, if you watch your, your knuckles very carefully, they have to expand sort of before they can shear. The same happens <coughs> in pressure dependent materials that have, say, a microstructure, like concrete has a microstructure with grains, soils have a microstructure with, with grains. For grains to shear past one another, they have to reconfigure. And that reconfiguration requires a volumetric expansion most of the time, but sometimes a volumetric uh, compaction. But in any case, there's always a volumetric rearrangement before shear can take place. Okay. That's the, the, another way to see it, if you like to speak in terms of energy principles, there's an energetic price to be paid 
in the volumetric sense before you can take that price in the divisoric sense. Okay? Metals don't have that. You you want shear, you apply a shear stress, and that's all you get. Okay, the the two responses are uncoupled. Here they're not. Okay. Okay, so this requires a different flow rule. Okay, same principles as before, but now for instance, epsilon dot AP is by definition uh, lambda dot as before, BG, D sigma A. Okay, so I'm computing, I'm, I'm using um, principal stresses and principal strains to write the formulation. <coughs> we'll, we'll, we'll come back later to the usual tensorial notation. So remember that G is a function of two principal stresses. It can be one, two, or three. But the important thing is the, the difference between the two. At any rate, let's say, if you like numbers like me, sometimes I want to see the sigma A as sigma one. Okay? So in the one direction, let's say in the x1 direction, if you want to see it like that, there is a principal stress, sigma one, acting in that direction. But there's also going to be a, a principal plastic strain rate in that direction. That's given in the usual flow rule way with your plastic potential giving you the direction. So lambda dot comes for the right. I know that that's just a sine function of sigma a minus sigma b. It's just a constant, either plus one or minus one, right? And then all I need is the derivative of the argument with respect to sigma a, so that's what, one, right? Then this is a constant, doesn't matter. And then I get a, another term, right? That looks like so. Uh, sine function of psi times another one, right? The derivative of uh, sigma a with respect to sigma a itself. You okay? I can do the same thing for epsilon dot p b. Lambda dot dg d sigma b, right? This is equal to lambda dot, the same sign function as before. But now I pick a minus one in front of this guy, right? Because I'm taking the derivative of minus sigma b with respect to sigma b, so I pick up a minus one. And then I get, as before, the sine function of sine. And finally, there's going to be a third principal strain direction, right? Epsilon dot P C, right? Some for some this is for A not equal to B, not equal to C, right? I'm taking the three permutations, one, two, three. You're gonna have three principal directions. Right? What happens in this direction? What's my plastic strain rate in that direction? Zero. Zero, right? Nothing. Because my plastic potential claims that. In fact, my, my yield stress, my, my yield surface claims that too. It says that don't matter what C is. It won't matter, in fact, what, uh, what the intermediate stress is. What all that matters, as Tresca believed as well, is that big difference between the biggest one and the smallest one. The intermediate one doesn't matter. And then here, the plastic potential or the flow rule is going further and it's telling you that all the deformations will happen in the two principal stress directions that are at the extremes. And then the intermediate one, let's say, if you want to see it in X2, nothing happens. There's no plastic deformation in that direction. OK? That's a modeling consequence. OK? It's a consequence of the model. OK? 
Okay, so then we can define what we're going to call um, epsilon VP as the trace of epsilon dot P. Okay. It's a definition. So this is the volumetric component of the plastic strain rate. That's what it means. And you know that by definition, just that's just the sum of these two. Right? The trace of epsilon dot p is just going to always be the sum of the three principal, or the I, if you will, these are the eigenvalues of epsilon dot p. So this is this. All right, and. Then I go ahead and sum these three things, right? So the third one doesn't contribute, but the first two do. I see that this cancels with that, so that goes away. And then I get something that looks like two lambda dot sine of psi. Ah, so I come to the first consequence of my formulation. Again, as we saw before, when I impose a shear stress in my sample, the volumetric response, the plastic volumetric deformation of that sample is going to be controlled by psi, right? Psi, so if you think of a sine function, right? Sine function starts at zero, at zero degrees, right? And it peaks and it becomes one right, at 90 degrees, and these are the typical values, remember the psi and phi are in that range, psi belongs to the 0, 90 range, just like phi does, okay, so the sine function just takes values between 0 and 1, as any sine function does, okay, so this is positive, This guy, by assumption, is positive in plasticity. So what this is telling you is that the volumetric strain rates for this model are always positive. The, the, the material wants to gain volume as you're imposing a shear stress. You see that? There's no other way. The, it can be zero, too when psi is zero, for instance. Okay, when you have the Tresca model, psi is zero, and you're back in Tresca, okay, no volumetric strength. Okay, but if you have anything that is between zero and 90, you will have some volumetric strength, plastic volumetric strength. Okay, that's one of the big consequences of the model, okay? So this means volumetric expansion, aka dilation. Again, your knuckle effect. That's all the model is is uh, is picking up. Okay, you want to shear? Great, shear, but you need to expand. Okay, so the other thing that is going to become very important is the difference between these two principal strain rates. Okay, so let's look at that. So when I take the difference between these two, these two now cancel out, the two sine functions cancel out, but these two don't, they add because they have different signs, right? So I get two lambda dot sine function of sigma A minus sigma B. Or, in other words, lambda dot equals one over 
two. Of I can rewrite this as the sine function of epsilon a dot p minus epsilon b dot p times the absolute value of the same thing. I haven't really changed anything, right? Because when I multiply this by that, all I get is the argument, right? Over what was there before, which is the sine function. Yeah. Now, this is either plus one or minus one, depending on whether the two sine functions are the same. If they're the same, it's positive. If, if, they're, if they're not the same, it's negative. Right? That's the only two options. So it turns out that so then if sine of epsilon a dot p minus epsilon b dot p equals the sine function of sigma a minus sigma. B, then this thing is positive. Right. This happens when you have something that we haven't mentioned much in this class, but when you have coaxiality. Meaning that your principal directions in stress, this ones, and your principal directions in strain rate, in this case plastic strain rate, are the same in coincide. Yeah. And we haven't, I haven't convinced you of that, but I'll show you the mathematical reasoning for that being the case. But essentially, every time you have an isotropic function, in this case, G or F, and you take the derivative of that isotropic function with respect to one of the principal directions of stress, what you get out is a principal direction in plastic strain rate that shares the same direction as the principal stress direction. And that's called coaxiality. Okay? Now, physically, what does it mean? It means that if I pull, let's do the simple case, in one direction that I'm going to call sigma 1, and call it also the x1 direction, and I have no other state of stress, let's say, only sigma 1. That would be my principal stress, right? So my, my, if my state of stress for this kind of loading, right, will be sigma equals sigma 1, 0, 0, and everybody else is zeros, right? And then you intuitively will expect, if I ask you what kind of Plastic strain rate would you expect? What would you say? Which way is your most tensile or more most expansive principal strain rate? In which direction? X1. I mean you, you would you would hope so. But that's an intuitive notion, okay? It, it has to do with the physical notion that the more you pull in one direction in terms of forces, the more you should ex expand or stretch in that direction. Okay? But, it, but mathematically, it doesn't have to be that way. When it is, that's called coaxiality. Okay? It means that the principal directions of this tensor coincide with the principal directions of this other tensor. And that's a mathematical consequence of a formulation. Now, there's going to be two other terms here, right, that are non-zero. But it don't matter, they're smaller than this. In fact, you'll have the opposite sign by the Poisson effect. Okay? But the, but the one that coincides with sigma 1 is this. Here. But at any rate, they are principal directions of strain, say x2 and x3. But they're still the same. You see, these are two principal directions also in x2 and x3. So these two tensors are perfectly coaxial. 
So this is true in coaxiality. Or when sigma is coaxial with epsilon dot p. Another way to say it is if you invoke the uh, the uh, spectral decomposition theorem that you probably learned in, in continuum mechanics, right? You have a second order tensor. This second order tensor is going to have, um, right, uh, three principal stresses and three principal directions, and you sum them all up like this, and you recompose the tensor, right? So what coaxiality means is this. It means that the basis for these two tensors in, in uh, principal directions are the same. Again, that's coaxiality. These, these are principal directions. They have the same principal directions. When they don't, this guy will have some other n hat a in some other direction that is not the one in n a direction. Okay? But when they do, they have the same basis. That's coaxial. Yeah. Okay. So that basically means that one is proportional to the other. So I wouldn't say that. Because when you see the I wouldn't say that. I don't think it goes to proportionality, right? Because, say, proportionality would mean that there will be a scalar right in between the two. So it's not quite the same. It's a, it's a tensor instead of a scalar, which is C or CP. And that is a tensor. Yeah, I don't know how to see that. I wouldn't say that. I'll, let's leave it at principal directions being the same. But I don't, I don't think you can find a matrix or a scalar that will multiply or divide one of the other and get the other one. I, I cannot see it. OK. So fine. So you have this. So, so when there's coaxiality, this becomes 1. OK. Then lambda dot is nothing but 1 half of this absolute value. That's all that matters. And as before, this is greater than or equal to zero, right? This is an absolute value, so it can only be positive. Okay, so this is good from a plasticity standpoint. Again, this is consistent with everything we want, right? With lambda dot being greater than or equal to zero, okay, so it's fine. And we are going to baptize this guy here as gamma A, B, P. And I'm putting a dot just to remind ourselves that that's a red. If you think about it, this is, or if you've seen all, all the other models, this is typically seen as a measure of distortion or shear. All right, so, um, and I'll try to explain to you why that's the case. So um, let's do it first. So, but, but let's, let's finish the math. So, so then lambda dot equals one half this gamma a b dot p. But we had seen before that lambda dot was also related to epsilon v p dot through this sine function. So um, uh, we see that it's here, right? So we see that this is also equal to um, one half epsilon v dot p over sine of psi. Yeah, the same thing. Okay, or 
that sine of psi equals um, epsilon b dot p over this gamma a b dot p. Okay, so this is what I really wanted to get. So this again is probably the clearest way of seeing this coupling between the volumetric deformation, which is the numerator, and a distortional deformation or a deviatoric deformation, which is the bottom, and how they are coupled via the sine function of psi. Okay, there is a proportionality. So in other words, let's say you impose this. You impose a certain shear, a certain deformation strain. In a, in a granular material, in a pressure-dependent material like this one, you are going to have a proportional volumetric expansion that is proportional to this modulus, this sine of psi. Okay. So they're not totally decoupled. One depends on the other via this dilated C parameter. Okay? Uh, so let's look at it in another way. So there is, just like there is a more Coulomb or a more circle in stress, there is also one in strain, okay? or at least in strain rate. So this is one half dot P. So you can, so just like there is a sigma tau plane, there is a <coughs> normal plastic strain rate, shear plastic strain rate plane, okay? And there's a one half there just for scaling, okay? So here is your epsilon A dot P. Here is your epsilon B dot P your two principal strains in this model, these are non-zero ones, okay? You're going to have a more circle in this uh, strain rate space. And this value here, the height of the circle is, of course, one half of epsilon A dot P minus epsilon B. Very similar to your stress, more circle, but this is in strain rate uh, space. Okay. Let's look for more uh, physical significance to this because this is this is a new concept, so I want I want to make sure that that you get this. Let's assume that we have a material point, a piece of material undergoing a homogeneous, or what you would call an affine deformation. So let's say it's just 2D, X1, X2, here's my original configuration of the material, and now I want to impose a deformed It's all a fine. Okay. So this is original or undeformed. This is deformed. Okay. Now, um, So this is a, what you would call a plane strain deformation. So if you were to write the kinematics of this deformation, say V1, how would you write it? What's the component of, say, the velocity or the time derivative of the displacement? U1 dot 
in the one direction. Hold your right, ladies and gentlemen. This is basic continuity. First, let's start from the beginning. What is the, the V1, the velocity in the one direction, a function of x1 or x2? x2, right? Nothing depends in, x, in x1, at least not for v1. Right? No matter where I am in x1, right? every fiber of my, of my material the forms in exactly the same way. So nothing is proportional to x1. Everything is proportional to x2. And then what else do I know? What happens at x2 equal to 0? <coughs> nothing moves, right? So all the fibers along the x1 line don't move. Right? And then they start to move proportional to the height. In fact, as they get higher, they'll move to. So there's some constant of proportionality C1 times X2. That gives me my deformation function in the V1 or in the one direction. Okay. I can do the same too for V2. Every, every fiber right, is going to move up as well. So this is V1. So let me try to sketch it. Right? So this is your V1 field. Yeah? There's going to be a V2 as well. Right? Which is this. Right? So V2 which is u2 dot equals some c2 x2. Zero, when I'm in the, the fiber x1, right? And then it gets proportionally larger as I go up. In other words, this vector here, b, right, has a component v1 and a component v2 and it's given by this okay all right so v3 zero okay. no deformation out of the plane right okay then you define your strain or your strain rates, right? And by definition, this is this. Let's say, is that how I'm calling it? Two, two, yes. Two, two. Right? Right, and then you have the shear. Strains. Uh, well, there's one half here. Okay. And then these other guys are zero. I don't think I, I don't think I have to convince you that they they don't matter. So nothing depends on the x two direction, or at least on the well, nothing in the three direction depends on the two direction, and nothing in the one direction depends on the three direction. So those guys are zero. The only potentially non-zero, this, this one is zero too, as you can see, right away. But even epsilon one one dot uh, is zero, right? Because nothing depends on x one. 
epsilon 2, 2 dot equals uh, C2. It's a constant, which makes sense because it's an affine deformation. And then the other non-trivial one is this guy, which is that. Let's see. Uh, I get a C1 from this component, and then I'm going to get a fat zero from the second component, right? Because the U2 dot component doesn't depend on X1. So my strain rate tensor, right, looks like this. Zero, C2, zero, one half, C1, one half, C1, and then everybody else <coughs> is zero. In 2D or in plain strain, you usually see it just Expresses a two by one, uh, as a two by two. Right? People don't bother. So it's a constant. <coughs> Meaning that this is an affine or homogeneous deformation, which we knew from the beginning. So again, when you look at that deformation, at least when I look at it, you say, okay, there is a, a, an epsilon 2, 2 dot component of deformation pulling the material out by a strength of C2. And then there is another component of shear, right, that is also shifting, if you will, or distorting the material by a strength of one half C1. Okay, that's, that's the kinematics of your deformation. If this is true, then you can see this as, a, as the same type of deformation that we're talking about in in plasticity, so this means negligible elastic deformations. Okay, so this looks very much like your plastic strain rate. So let's now go to our more space for strain rate. Right? and try to plot these strain rates. So what do we get? So we have this normal plastic strain rate. And then here we have this one half shear plastic strain rate. So it helps people sometimes visualize the state of strain. So again, you have an epsilon 2, 2 dot pulling up, if you will. And then you have a shear strain here. That is uh, one half. This one half gamma, one two, right? Which is this is what we're calling, we're calling gamma one two. Okay. Chi. Okay, and then you have them here, and you have them. That's your state of strain, just like you have a state of stress. And you can picture it like this, you have a state of strain. Now you put it here on the more plane. So one of your faces, 
let's say, let's start with this one, if you, if you want. Uh, your normal strain in that direction, say in the one direction, is how much? Zero. And then you have a state of strain that is one half gamma one two. So you plot that here, so you have zero normal strain, right? And uh, what we've been calling, so I have a problem with my notation. Ah, yes, so I call So if so, I have a problem here. Hold on. So if this is what I'm go calling gamma one two, <coughs> then this cannot be half gamma one two. This has to be gamma one two, right? Gamma dot one two. You see what I mean? Because because if I'm calling this gamma one two, that means that essentially I'm com calling gamma one two. C1, and then if I call this half of C1, I don't know, I'm, I'm, uh, this is not half of C, this whole thing is half of C1, and then C1 is gamma 1, 2, okay? So, all right, so then here, this is, this height here, the point is that this is half of C1. Or if you want to see it, this is also half of gamma one two dot. So this point in the coordinate system that we have chosen is zero comma one half of gamma dot one two. It's this point corresponds to the state of strain on this face. Then you go to the state of strain on the other phase, right? It has the same amount of shear deformation. So this distance is minus one half C1, or if you will, minus one half gamma one two. And then this distance here is whatever epsilon 2, 2 is. So this is epsilon 2, 2 dot, comma, minus, no, that's not the way you represent it, but if you go minus, is it x, y? No, yeah, it, it is x, y. Right, so you go epsilon 2, 2 dot, comma minus one half, comma one two, so. So if you will, if you want to give us numbers, this would be C uh, two, and this is minus one half C one, right? Just like this is zero comma one half C one. Okay, join them. This would be the center of my circle. And then I can draw my circle based on that center and the diameter. Okay, so I have a more, a more circle of strain state, strain rate. 
right? Given that state of strain rate, I can draw that. All right? And I know a few things. This is what I know. So the first thing I know is that this distance from that point to this point is C1. I'm jumping. Okay. I also know that this distance is C2. Right? So I essentially know these two lengths of a triangle. And then I know the third length of a triangle, this one. Right? That's the diameter of a triangle. Right? How can I get that? What is the diameter in general? What is it be? It's that, right? If I knew these points, this would be my right? Those are my principal strains. These, the problem with this is that this is not in principal strain space quite yet. This gives me a general state of strain on the more circle space, but then from that I can get these two guys. But anyway, I know that the difference between these two guys is exactly the same distance as that. It's a fact, isn't it? And we call that, we've given that a name, we call this guy gamma AB, right? Okay, and we said further that that guy is related to psi and so on, but I, I'll do it in, in, a, in a bit. Let me see here. So, Also, even from here, I know that this has to be equal. So C2 squared plus C1 squared, square rooted, also has to be this distance. Right? I take C2 squared, C1 squared, square rooted, and that's this distance. All right? Right? OK. So let's call that 2 times the radius. which has to also be equal to. All right, then let's look at this guy again. This might be back in the real business. Okay, so if you look at this or you look at this, whatever you're looking, what's the volumetric strain rate in this state of the formation? What is epsilon dot B D? Is it what? C2, right? There's, there's nothing else. You just take the trace of this guy, it's C2. Then we said this guy on the bottom is twice this guy, right? So essentially, um, 
Well, this guy is this guy, right? It's C2 squared plus C1 squared square root. Okay? Then, uh, what you can do is divide the numerator and the denominator by C2. Right? Is that what I want to do? No. I want to divide everything by C1. So I get C2 over C1. All right? So that's fine. Um, and then I can enter that C1 into here, OK? So I'm going to get um, 1 because C2 squared over C, I'm sorry, C1 squared over C1 squared will give me 1. And then the other term will look like C2 over C1, all of that squared, all of this square root. Okay? I haven't changed anything. All right. Then um, I can write this as the ratio of B. <coughs> 2 over v1, that's what they are, okay, over 1 plus, again, the same ratio, and then I take it back to the original form for v1 over v1 squared plus v2 squared square rooted. Or if you haven't really realized it yet, the tangent of psi being equal to, so this, is, this looks a lot like a tangent function. This is not v1, I'm sorry, yes, this is v2. So this guy here is going to this side, this angle. You could have seen it, in fact, I don't know why I did all of this. You see it from here. Okay, you see that there is this C2 over, right, the radius or the diameter, if you will. And that is... It's a sign of that. That's a sign, right? So, so then, therefore, C2 over C1, so this is also equal to C2 over C1, which is the tangent. Okay. Now, um, let's see, is there a better way to see it? Um, So, if you look at this, right, this expression also makes sense because if you look at this angle as the sine of psi, so the sine is the opposite angle over the hypotenuse. So that's this. So from there, you can see that psi needs to be located here. All right? And then you can then, once you know that, then the tangent of that psi will always be the opposite angle, the opposite side over the adjacent side to the angle, which is C1. Now, all of that is just geometric interpretation, but the, the point is that if you go back to the deformation state that we had, remember, and we had this velocity here, V, this velocity vector. This is V1. This is V2, or the component 
of v in the two direction. What this expression is saying is that psi is what? Where is psi? Here. This guy. This guy. I think that's really the most important part. So again, I have a state of affirmation. I have a shearing state of affirmation, a distortional state of affirmation. But in these materials, that distortional state of affirmation, that V1, is accompanied by a V2. It comes as a byproduct that you cannot escape. Okay? V2 will be always V1 times tangent of psi in these materials. No way around it. Okay? Whereas in other materials, rubber, metals, V1 and V2 are independent of each other. Here they're not. Okay? And their coupling comes from this dilated tendency or this uh, uh, angle of dilation. And what that angle of dilation is physically is this distance. When dilation is zero, all you get is a pure shear. When dilation is not zero, say 15 degrees, you're going to get tangent of 15 degrees times whatever velocity you're putting in the x direction. That's going to give you your velocity in the y direction. In fact, that's exactly how people calculate these things in the laboratory. Okay, they put a certain V1, and they let the V2 be a, a, a free uh, boundary condition, and they measure that V2. And whatever they get, that's how they calculate the sum. OK. okay. Um, questions about this? It's important that this makes at least intuitive sense to is psi typically constant or can it also vary with stress? It will vary with stress. stress. In fact, it will vary with uh, the state of the formation. It's, uh, we would see later, maybe not in this class, but psi is a spendable property. It begins being non-zero, let's say, and then it tends to zero. So we initially took a derivative with respect to superficial stress, and so in reality, have the same like Oh, yeah, right, 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 right. So here we're assuming that psi is constant in this model, but in reality it's not. Yeah, in fact, in this model we're also assuming that t is constant, and in reality it's not. So. But one problem that I think we have in modeling right now, at least one problem that I had to face when I was um, studying all of these things, is that you see people that are very good at doing experimentation and then you know, observing tendencies in material response, let's say. And then you have people that do modeling. And then you see very few people being able to cross across the modeling to the material response. I'm trying to, to, to say that it's very hard for people to then come from here and say, okay, how can we reconcile this? This is my modeling machinery with the observational machinery, what people see in reality. How far is my model from that? Here I'm assuming a constant psi. Is that reality? Is that not reality? Is, is psi a, vari a variable? If so, of what? How can I incorporate that into my model? And I think we're personally guilty of that because we don't teach a class where we do that. Okay, we, because of time constraints, we teach a class on modeling of plasticity. But then we don't teach a class on modeling of reality, if you will. You see what I mean? Uh, and, 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 and the goal is to model reality. Okay, it's not so much to model plasticity. Uh, plasticity is the tool to model reality. So. So you need to make this effort kind of on your own. 
You have to take your models and all of the frameworks you have, and then you need to challenge them and take them to the next level. But that that requires some some confidence on your part, right? Because you're, you might find out that your model is totally useful, useless right, in front of reality. But at some point, you need to be curious about it. The model is general enough so you can make C1 and C2 a function of T, and still everything else will follow. Yes, right. Yeah, that is, that is true. But yeah, but I think that I think that most people just don't know even how to begin to take a model like this and compare it with, say, even an experiment from the laboratory. Mm -hmm. uh, That's right. And, and uh, so I, I think that so if you are a person that is able to do that, you would become one of a kind, uh, and that would be a great niche uh, in your career if you were to be able to take this into the next stage, right? The, the opposite is more difficult. You very rarely see an experimentalist being able to come here. And again, those that can do this, that can do that, can come here and take this framework and use it to interpret their experimental results, are usually the ones that end up in the, in the Academy of Engineering. I think that those are the ones that make it um, So try, always try to do that, to, to go to the reality and also from reality to the frameworks.